Well hello everyone, a uh, warm welcome to our evening video stream from Grace Church Sandbach and Wheelock Heath Baptist Church. We're really glad that you're able to join us. If you don't know me, my name is Paul and I serve as a pastor at Grace Church. Let's begin our worship uh, this evening uh, by hearing from God's Word, the Bible. I'm going to read a few verses from 1 Timothy uh, verses 15 to 17 uh, written by the Apostle Paul. Here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for this very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honour for ever and ever. Amen. What a great God we have. What a merciful God we have who came to save sinners, even the worst of sinners, uh, even Paul and even you and me. Uh, so let's come now and worship this God in prayer. Let's pray together. Loving Lord God, we come this evening to worship you, to praise you, and you are so worthy of our praise. Uh, we praise you that you are the King. You are the one who reigns over everything, every detail of the universe. Uh, we praise you that you are the eternal God, that you have no beginning and no end. There was never a time and there never will be a time uh, when uh, you were not there. We praise you that you are the immortal God, the God who can never die. And we praise you that you are invisible, that you are so different from us, uh, that apart from the Lord Jesus coming to live in the world, there is no way that anyone could lay their eyes on you. And Lord, we come to worship you, the awesome God, acknowledging that in ourselves we are full of sin. We can relate, Father, to the Apostle Paul when he says, he is the worst of sinners. Heavenly Father, we confess that our sin is horrible. Our rebellion against you, the way we have behaved towards you, is horrible. And Father, we confess that when we find ourselves thinking that we're really not that bad, we confess that that self-righteousness is horrible. And so, Father, we praise you for your amazing mercy. We thank you that the Lord Jesus didn't come into the world for quite good people. We thank you that Jesus came into the world to save sinners, even the worst of sinners. Father, we thank you that Jesus swapped places with us on the cross. We praise you uh, that he took the penalty for our sin on his shoulders and that he clothed us in his perfect righteousness. What love you have shown us. What mercy. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray that you would help us. Pray that your Holy Spirit would help us this evening to worship you and to be thrilled again by your great mercy. And we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing our first song now, uh, a wonderful hymn uh, that speaks of the amazing grace that God has shown us. It's called A Debtor to Mercy Alone.
we're going to spend some time now praying and um, we're going to be praying in our homes and so I'm going to give a, a few uh, pointers to things we can be praying for as usual three different areas to be praying for uh, this week. Uh, firstly we're going to be praying for Emmanuel Church in Leftwich uh, just a little bit um, uh, north from here and um, uh, there that you may well know the pastor is Dovan Williams and um, uh, Dave Hart serves as the assistant pastor there and uh, uh, let's be praying let's pray for Dovan um, as he continues uh, with uh, treatments and um, uh, has uh, another biopsy coming up in a few weeks time uh, but the things that they've actually asked us to pray for uh, firstly uh, to give thanks uh, for six new members joining the church in this last month that's great news isn't it let's rejoice with them in that uh, pray for progress with the building plans it's been obviously pretty disrupted during recent times uh, let's pray uh, specifically uh, that the mortgage plans will be completed uh, for that building work uh, pray for wisdom for them as they come out of lockdown uh, currently they're meeting uh, in um, uh, in a school rather like we are in Grace Church and so that could have complications about their meeting together so uh, let's pray for that uh, and then also let's pray for them as they think about online evangelism they're wondering whether to do Christianity Explored online or put short testimonies online uh, let's pray that God would help them to know what would be the most effective thing for them to do so that's Emmanuel Leftwich secondly we're praying for a hundredfold uh, where our own Ben and Liz are both uh, very much involved. You'll remember a hundredfold uh, 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 produced these little chips, these little micro SD cards uh, to be um, uh, provided for people in countries where uh, they'd otherwise, otherwise not be able to hear uh, the good news of Jesus. And these little cards have uh, the Bible and uh, uh, other good Christian resources on uh, for those people. Uh, and so uh, let's pray that many people will be reached through those SD cards uh, for the Lord Jesus. A uh, couple of particular things that Ben and Liz mentioned in their last email. Uh, firstly, uh, Moira Baptist Church in Northern Ireland. Ben had the opportunity to speak uh, for a few minutes to them um, in their uh, online uh, video stream uh, last week. And um, uh, Ben was really encouraged by that church. Uh, and um, uh, the children have been doing activities to raise money for a hundredfold. And um, uh, so let's give thanks for that and pray that God would use that money uh, to bring the gospel to more people and then also uh, 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 for Ben himself um, uh, uh, he's been working on a simpler project uh, for people to donate uh, online uh, Ben says the, the the current or the old system for donating online is rather complicated lots of hoops to jump through uh, but they've been developing uh, the techie people have been developing uh, this um, uh, new procedure that should be much simpler so let's pray that that would be useful in encouraging more people to give and the third area that we're going to pray for this evening is our own Sunday services at Wheelock Heath and Grace Church uh, we trust that God will if it's his will enable us very soon uh, to be able to begin something on Sundays given the new um, uh, uh, guidance from the government but it's going to be tricky to work out exactly what we can do and when and how soon we should do that and what it will look like uh, and how we'll uh, be able to help those who can't join us um, uh, physically at this time. Uh, so please do pray for wisdom in, in that whole area. Uh, please do uh, uh, pray that we would care well uh, for those who have different needs uh, and especially for those who might not be able to join us when we do reopen uh, physically. Uh, and please pray particularly for ourselves as elders and deacons in the two churches as we'll be meeting this Thursday uh, to try and talk through some of these questions and we do value your prayers for wisdom. So let's spend some time now praying for those things, for Emmanuel Leftwich, uh, for a hundredfold, uh, and for our Sunday services.
please can you make that your last prayer? Loving Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for hearing our prayers this evening. Uh, thank you that you have heard every prayer in every home, uh, uh, those spoken out loud and those spoken to you in our hearts. And Father, we praise you that you are a good God, the God that we can depend on. Uh, thank you that we can be sure that you will answer each of our prayers in the way that is best. And Heavenly Father, we turn, as we turn now to your words, we praise you that you are a speaking God. Uh, we praise you for your word, the Bible, which is perfect, which your Holy Spirit has breathed out. And we ask, please, now that your Holy Spirit would open our eyes and give us our ears to hear and help us to put into practice what your word says. In Jesus' name. Amen. This evening we're continuing our series in the book of Nehemiah. Um, as you may know, if you were here last week, we're now in the final chapter, uh, at chapter 13. If you have a Bible with you, you may want to turn to that. Uh, we're looking at Nehemiah 13, uh, verses 10 uh, to 14. So Nehemiah chapter 13, and starting at verse 10. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their, at their posts. And Judah brought the tithes of the grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. I put Shelemiah the priest, Zadok the scribe, and a Levite named Pediah in charge of the storerooms, and made Hanan son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, their assistant, because they were, they were considered trustworthy. They were made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of God and its services. Well, across the world and across the UK, there are sadly many, many churches that have drifted into neglect. I don't mean grand old church buildings, that have decayed into ruins. I mean churches, congregations of God's people. Uh, churches once vibrant, but now lifeless. Churches once beacons of light to their communities, but now inward focused. Uh, churches that started out with great excitement to serve Jesus and to make him known. Uh, but they've settled into dull routines. Uh, churches that were once known for boldly standing for the truth of Jesus, but they started giving in, first on smaller issues, and then later bigger issues. Churches once characterised by holiness and devotion to the Lord, but slowly their desire to live for God uh, has waned. Could that happen in our churches, in Wheelock Heath or in Grace Church? Well, if any congregation of God's people was immune from this kind of drift, uh, neglect, surely it was the people of God in Nehemiah's day. Here was a people who had seen a great need at the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls, uh, and they'd responded to that need, uh, they committed themselves to that work, they had persevered in the face of opposition. Uh, they had confessed their sins. Uh, they had rejoiced in what God had done for them. And they made a covenant commitment uh, to serve the Lord faithfully. After 12 chapters of such encouragement, we come to Nehemiah 13 looking forward to it hopefully going out on a high. But instead in chapter 13, 
we're brought down with a bump. Now, Nehemiah 13 uh, is a warning that we need to hear because so often great works of God uh, and faithful Bible teaching churches can drift into neglect. Verse 6 tells us Nehemiah had to go back to his job of serving the king and now he returns to find a range of problems uh, that have sprung up since the heady days of the earlier chapters. Uh, last week uh, we saw how Nehemiah came back to find Tobiah, a sworn enemy of God's people, uh, being allowed to store his goods at the temple. And in tonight's passage the problem is neglect. Verses 10 uh, and 11 we see a neglect so soon. A neglect so soon. Uh, specifically, there is a neglect of giving. Have a look at verse 10. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back in, uh, to their own fields. The Levites would come uh, from the local areas uh, to serve at the temple on behalf of God's people. And their time spent in the temple was time not spent uh, out in the fields to get food for their families. They depended on the rest of God's people to support them financially. And so you can picture them saying goodbye to their family, uh, heading towards the city with joy in their hearts in serving God, trusting that they will receive the money they need uh, to keep their family alive. And finally they arrive and they find the Charlotte and Tobiah there, but they don't find the money they need to pay for their service. And they have no choice but to go back home because otherwise their wives and children will starve. It was such a stark contrast from chapter 12, verse 44. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits and tithes. From the fields around the towns, they were uh, to bring in to the storerooms the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and Levites. They were pleased with the Levites' ministry. Uh, they were pleased, it was their pleasure to give so the Levites' work in serving God could continue. But now in chapter 13, how things have changed. Their hearts were no longer pleased to give to the Lord's work. In recent work weeks, we've been enjoying ordering presents over the internet for our daughter Sarah's birthday. And whenever we're buying presents for a birthday, uh, we have a budget that we try to stick to. But when it comes down to it, we find it really hard to keep to that budget. Uh, maybe we've uh, reached the budget, but then we see something and we think, oh, she would really love that. And so we buy that too. We love our children. And so it's uh, not a burden to be generous. We want to be generous. The challenge is to restrict ourselves, restrain ourselves. In a similar kind of way, our giving to God reflects our love for him. Uh, the more we love him, uh, the more we will want to give as far as we're able to do that. And now for God's people in Nehemiah's time, what had been a joy has become a burden. Uh, their passion for the Lord was gone. The goodwill towards God's servants was gone. And so the Levites were not paid and they couldn't carry out their job. Now, how might we apply this to ourselves today? Most of us will not make a snap decision at some point to just stop giving unless circumstances force us to or unless there's some big breakdown in fellowship. But for all of us as Christians, it's very easy for our giving to drift because we neglect to think about it. Uh, maybe our giving is less intentional, less thought through than it once was. 
Uh, giving by standing order is a very helpful way to give, not least because it enables us to claim gift aid straightforwardly. But are we making time to think intentionally about our giving? Do you review your giving from time to time? Maybe you, you've lost your income and your giving needs to come down. Or maybe you have a bit more than you once did and you could easily start giving more. But above all, do you neglect to remind yourself of who you are giving to in the first place? Like in Nehemiah's day, giving to the Lord so that the Lord's work can be done. See, the problem for God's people went deeper than just a neglect of giving. It was also a neglect of worship. Look at verse 11. So I rebuked the officials... And I asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Now here is the heart of the problem. The house of God, where the people came to worship God in the Old Testament. And it was being neglected. And this was happening so soon after their joyful worship, just a few chapters earlier. Reminds me of a scene uh, near the start of C.S. Lewis's Narnia book. Uh, Prince Caspian. Four children find themselves back in Narnia for a second time. Hundreds of Narnian years have passed since they were last there and they are shocked to see that their old castle at Caer Paravel has fallen into ruins. It's not been being looked after. Uh, they'd left Narnia with Aslan the lion triumphant but by the time they return well some people may have heard of Aslan but they think he's just a mythical figure. Nehemiah uh, calls out the officials for their neglect of God's house. And for us, well, for us, worship is not about a particular location. Uh, Jesus is the temple now. Uh, for us, neglecting the house of God is when we neglect the worship of Jesus. We might ask ourselves, are we less thrilled by Jesus than we once were? Uh, do we delight to be with God's people, worshipping God together as much as we once did? Perhaps one application at the moment relates to the restarting of church services after lockdown when that's able to happen. Uh, now it may be that for some of us it's not safe to come uh, when, we're, when the rest of us are able to physically uh, reopen. Uh, and we need to respect that situation for those people. But perhaps for others, for some of us, we might have got into a comfortable routine. We quite like church on the sofa. Uh, we quite enjoy uh, staying in our pyjamas on a Sunday morning. Uh, we like the flexibility of watching the service uh, later, if that suits us better. Maybe we quite like not having to engage in conversation with people after the service. And when, as a church, we can meet together again physically to worship God, will we be tempted not to come? Or uh, there may be areas of service in the church, uh, which you normally do, but they need to be put on hold during lockdown. And when we're able to do those things again, uh, will we serve with the same vigour uh, that we served before? Uh, more generally, uh, where, uh, where are you in danger of drifting in your worship of God? Are there areas that you and I have neglected that we need to be challenged on? Have we been neglectful in our love for Jesus? In our godliness? in our commitment to biblical truth, in our zeal to serve the Lord, in our delight in sacrificial giving. So how much does all this matter? Well, for people in Nehemiah's day, it was very serious. Now, their neglect of giving and their neglect of worship was also a neglect of covenant. Look back at chapter 10, verse 39. At the end of all the things they promised to do, they say, we will not neglect the house of our God. 
Now those were fine words, but so soon they were words that the people had failed to keep. How easy it is to make promises to God and yes, mean them at the time, but not fulfil them. Lord, I will never do that again. And a week or a month or a year or ten years later, we've broken that promise. Just like the people in Nehemiah, in our lives too, there can be neglect so soon. But thankfully things do get better. Let's turn to verses 11 to 13, uh, where we see a new reformation for now. A new reformation for now. Uh, verse 11. Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. All Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil into the storerooms. Nehemiah's intervention leads to a fresh revival. Uh, the people are giving again. Uh, and Nehemiah puts in plans, uh, puts in place uh, a system of plans to help the Reformation to continue. Uh, verse 13, trustworthy people uh, made responsible for distributing the supplies to their fellow Levites. Trustworthy people to make sure that the job gets done. Uh, and the sad, uh, after the sad neglect uh, that had been happening, it is like a new reformation uh, from Nehemiah's wise leadership, but above all, uh, from God laying it on all the people's hearts to start giving again. What an encouragement that should have been. God is so merciful uh, with his children when we fail. He is so merciful when we have been drifting. He loves to restore us, to bring us back. But we also need here a dose of realism. I don't know whether uh, you're someone who's into making New Year's resolutions. I used to make them uh, some years ago, to be honest. One of the reasons I don't tend to make them these days uh, is because I know I'm absolutely rubbish at keeping them. I can't really remember now, but uh, the sort of resolution I might have made would be that this year, I'm going to practice my violin proper, properly, uh, rather than just for 20 minutes on the day I'm going to have the lesson. And I did really want to be more consistent with practicing. Uh, and maybe every so often I might make that kind of resolution and, and keep it for a few days or a couple of weeks, but those resolutions never last it. Well, just a few years before, uh, the people in Nehemiah's day had been on fire for the worship of God, uh, flocking from all around to hear several hours of preaching uh, and spending several hours in praise and in prayer and confessing their sin, committing themselves again to serving the Lord. Uh, their joy in what God had done was real and heartfelt. But so quickly it had decayed away again. And the revival in chapter 13, uh, just like the one earlier in the book, was only temporary. By the time Jesus came, there were still uh, the faithful Zechariah's and Elizabeth's uh, and Je Joseph's and Mary's and Simeon's and Anna's. But as a whole, God's people had again drifted a long way from where they had once been. Uh, from the doctrinally bankrupt Sadducees, to the nitpicking self-righteous Pharisees. Nehemiah will have known that tendency from his reading of the Bible. God's people in Moses' day are praising God for bringing them out of Egypt and then so quickly worshipping the golden calf. God's people in the days of the judges crying out for God's mercy, turning back to the Lord and then time after time going back to the worship of other gods. God's people in Hezekiah's day or Josiah's day, days of reformation among God's people, but within a few short decades reverting back to their old ways once again. Or think of the wonderful work that God did in bringing reformation in the 1500s 
Uh, the church is coming back to the Bible, coming back to the true gospel of justification by faith alone. But 150 years later, many of those churches had become sterile and inward looking. Times of revival, times of great works of God are so often followed by a drift into ungodliness. And that could easily have led Nehemiah and it could easily lead us to feel somewhat disillusioned. We might think, why bother if it probably won't last? Well, we, when we, what Nehemiah does in these verses, it won't change the world forever. But we need to see it is still worth it. It was a really good thing, even though not a lasting thing, uh, that God's people returned to faithful giving and to proper worship. And so too for us, it is still worth fighting against that particular sin in our lives. Even we know that there will always be other sins, similar sins, plaguing us uh, through all our life until we die. It is still uh, worth starting a new plan to read your Bible. Even if every time you've done that before, uh, you've given in and, and, and stopped in the end. It's been good for a while uh, and then we've got into that bad habit again. It is still worth uh, having another go. It is still worth starting a new ministry in the life of the church to seek to reach out to the community. Uh, even though it might be that that ministry will at some point lose its edge a few years down the line. It is still worth planting new churches when God enables us to do that. Uh, even though those churches will, even if they succeed, they will eventually become established churches with the same issues and the same problems as every other church. But it's still worth doing. Nehemiah knows God's people are fickle. But Nehemiah is not disillusioned. Uh, he knows that his reforms are worth doing. And here is why. A neglect so soon, a new reformation for now, but finally a God we can be sure of forever. A God to be sure of forever. Verse 14. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done in the house of my God and its services. Now, as we hear that, we might wonder, is that pride? Is that self-righteousness, the Pharisee of Nehemiah's day? Well, maybe. But then again, Nehemiah has uh, done the right thing in calling God's people back to faithful worship and faithful giving. And Nehemiah is not claiming sinless perfection. He's not claiming that his achievement makes him righteous in the right before God. Now, what he's saying is that in this particular situation, he has served God faithfully. And perhaps those around him don't appreciate that. And so he's entrusting this particular situation to God. This is the motivation for his reforms. Uh, this is his safeguard against becoming disillusioned by the fickleness of the people. He casts his hope not on their faithfulness, but on God's faithfulness. Reminds me of the pioneer missionary, uh, William Carey, pioneer missionary uh, to India, uh, who is now sometimes known as the father of modern missions, but he wasn't always so widely respected. Uh, when he made known his desire to take the gospel to India to a meeting of church leaders, he was interrupted by an older minister uh, who said, Young man, sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he'll do it without consulting you or me. But despite the opposition, Carey went to India because he knew before God that that was the right thing to do. And then when he got to India, he served for seven long years without seeing a single Indian turn to Christ in that time. But he kept going because he knew that this was what God had called him to do. And he knew that God was the only one whose opinion 
ultimately matters. Let me mention two things about God that can encourage us not to become disillusioned in serving the Lord. Uh, firstly, remember that God is the giver. Before we ever give anything to God, God has always given us so much more first. As Nehemiah looks at the fickleness of the people, uh, he can remind himself of what God is like. Uh, God gave Abraham uh, promises that he did not deserve. Uh, God gave the people a uh, land that they did not deserve. Uh, God gave them rescuers time after time after time who they did not deserve. Uh, God gave his people all they needed in Nehemiah's day to rebuild the city wall. God is the ultimate giver. Uh, John 3 verse 16, God so loved the world that he gave. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And so for us, even though our best efforts so often don't last, don't be disillusioned. It is worth pressing on for his sake. It is worth turning back to God when we've drifted. For his sake, he is worth it. And then also remember that God is the covenant keeper. Remember how God describes himself in Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation. This is the faithful God. This is the God that you and I can rely on. Unlike us, this God does not blow hot and cold. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Unlike the people in Nehemiah's day and unlike us, Jesus perfectly kept the covenant. His perfect obedience is counted uh, to covenant breakers like us. Just like the people uh, in Nehemiah, we could never have kept uh, the old covenant that depends on our faithfulness. But Jesus has brought us into a new covenant, a better covenant, a covenant that is not based on our keeping our promises, but based on God keeping his promises. A covenant that gives us forgiveness of all our sin. It gives us a new heart, the Holy Spirit poured out into God's people. And that means that we can take real heart this evening. Yes, we can expect to go up and down as Christians. Yes, we can expect that the great highs won't last forever. But we can also expect real change. Uh, we can expect that the Holy Spirit will work in us fruit that will last. So when we're tempted to dwell on our failures, to dwell on our fickleness, let's lift our eyes up to the Lord and find that he is the one that we can be sure of. Let's finish our time this evening. Uh, by singing together uh, a song that praises God for his great grace and kindness to us. Grace unmeasured, vast and free.
Well, thank you very much for watching this evening. Uh, let's close with a short prayer. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip us with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>